and good evening. Uh, my name is Olivia Brooks and I work at Vandercote College of Music. Um, I help out in the admissions department and help out with the continuing education program. And tonight I'm so excited to introduce to you Dr. Davila Cortez. Um, she's going to talk to you about shifting today and some of, uh, she has some exercises. So feel free to play along with her as um, she goes throughout. Um, the class. And um, before we get started, I'd just like to introduce her. So uh, Yvonne Davila Cortez is originally from Chicago and began Suzuki violin at the age of five. She attended DePaul University and received her BM in music business and violin performance. During that time, she had the opportunity to substitute with the Chicago Civic Orchestra, and she received her MM in violin performance at UW-Madison. Dr. Davila Cortez has appeared as a soloist at the Ames Music Festival in Spain and at the Rural Musicians Forum in Spring Green, Wisconsin. Dr. Davila Cortez was a member of the Rockford Symphony Orchestra and a substitute with the Madison Symphony Orchestra. She served as an adjunct instructor at Ripton College, conducted an elementary string orchestra in McFarland, Wisconsin, and established Suzuki Violin Studios in both Madison and Spring Green, Wisconsin. Uh, Dr. Davila Cortez moved to Texas to pursue her teaching certification and doctorate in music and human learning at the University of Texas at Austin. And during her time in Texas, Dr. Davila Cortez was orchestra director of a middle school in Round Rock ISD. She was also the director of the Austin Youth a Concentra uh, Cons Wait, I'm sorry, Concertant Orchestra, and she maintained a private Suzuki studio and served on the faculty of the University of Texas at Austin String Project, for which she has served as preschool coordinator and assistant director. Dr. Davila Cortez's research interests focus on children's musical development, parent education, and children's musical achievement. Dr. Davila Cortez has presented her research at the Suzuki of the Americas Association, American String Teachers, and Texas Music Educators Association conferences. And at now at Vandercook College of Music, she's the director of string music education, and she also leads our One City Strings program, which is an amazing outreach program. Um, she helps teach kids um, in underserved community all throughout the Bronzeville community. She offers free lessons and free, um, every student gets a free instrument, which is truly an amazing thing that she uh, helps lead. So we're so lucky to have her. If you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I will definitely uh, have Dr. Davila Cortez answer them. But uh, without further ado, please enjoy the masterclass. Thank you, Olivia. I really appreciate it. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here tonight and uh, spending some time with me with me to talk about one of my favorite things, the violin. <laughs> so the things we're doing today, if anybody's a violist, this also will apply to you, um, but it is going to be violin focused. And it's, I'm excited to share and maybe troubleshoot some things that are common when we are doing our shifting. So I am going to share my screen and I am a true teacher. And those who are teachers are going to laugh at this one. You're going to see my messy screen because I'm working all the time. So that's okay. So I'm gonna share screen. Whew, not too bad. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna do a little presentation on like the nuts and bolts about shifting. And then we'll go into some exercises that I used on my students. And I, of course, use on myself. And it's really good refresher when you are doing this with your students. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about was where you place your hand on the instrument. I like to call that first knuckle line. That's right here. I call it the baseline. And that's what I have a line going across. And then I have something called the magic X. Perhaps you've heard of that before that term. And right on the side of your hand is that magic X. That's the very first important thing to be aware of of your body. So then the next thing you need to know is where the neck and the fingerboard meet. Of course, you know where that is, but I'm just bringing an awareness to it. So exactly where the black fingerboard meets the neck, which is the lighter brown. And that is where you're going to place the magic X. It's gonna be right where those two colors meet. I don't have finger tapes on my instrument because it's my professional instrument, but the baseline will go behind your very first finger tape. 
touching the magic X to that line where the colors meet and baseline behind first finger tape. The reasoning is that that way when you curve your first finger to touch your tape, you can have a nice tall finger which is needed for intonation, vibrato, and shifting. So our next slide shows that the line, the baseline, and the X are exactly where it's meeting. Again, I don't have finger tapes on my professional violin, so just imagine that there is a line right in front of that bass line. Then my favorite thing to call, uh, call my thumb thumbo. Uh, it, it, it's more, first it was thumbelina, then thumbelino, and then it just turned into thumbo. And thumbo, it's really important. Uh, I wouldn't draw on my student's hand, so I always draw drew on myself and you want to make sure that the eyes are at the tip of the thumb and then the smiley face is just for fun the important thing is that thumb bow has to look up at the ceiling or the sky so i always joke around so when you have your thumb i'm sure you've seen this before some people bring the thumb up too high and then they're like coming over like it's being nosy and he wants to see what everyone's doing. And I'm like, no, don't be nosy. Mind your business. And you don't want Thumbo to hide. Thumbo's not shy either. I'm sure you've seen some students go underneath or maybe you have a hard time and you have it underneath. Thumbo is not shy either. Thumbo is just peeking out just right, not too far either way, but just peeking. So here you see Thumbo just peeking looking at the ceiling, not being nosy and looking at everybody's business. Here's Thumbo. Next is to realize that we have finger, um, like the lines, or uh, let me say the tips, the contact point of our fingers when it touches the string moves along first of all it's very very important that the very first finger if you're looking at your hand that line is as far left as you can when you bring your first finger down and it touches the string when you do that it's easier to rotate your hand and maintain nice tall fingers with my students, what I used to do is that we would set this up and then I put Smarties on the top and we would count to five. And if you could hang on to your Smartie, I would turn away and I say, throw it away. And I didn't look at what happened to those Smarties because, you know, we can't give candy at school. It's terrible. So uh, you can notice that the the contact point moves across the fingers as we go so by the time you're at the fourth finger it may or may not be towards the middle and that's how you know you have a good rotation the two pictures is one if you were looking at your fingers how does that look like or if you had it flat on a table and then here are the contact points of the finger on the string i want to emphasize you may see that my Pinky looks a little funny there, and my first finger is not quite what it, where I would really like it. I have very small hands, so I actually have a hard time putting down all four fingers at once. So normally, I would I would lift them up a little bit more than this, because if I have it down, then you get a little bit of a funny shape. So if you're wondering why isn't it completely taller, that's why, because I have such petite hands. But you can still see where each contact point is and how it moves along when you put your fingers down on the string. Why is this important? What does this have to do with shifting? Well, if you have your hand frame set, one, your intonation gets much, much better because all you do is pick up your fingers like little needles going up and down like a machine. As we're moving up, you want to maintain your hand frame because then you can do vibrato and you're in tune. Once you have that set, it's so easy to go up and down. I really, in any professional, we don't have to think about it because we have our hand frame set. All right, let's talk about shifting. Just like a candy cane, if you notice the red stripe on a candy cane, it is not straight up 
and down. If anything, it's wrapping around the candy cane. And that is what Thumbo is going to do with the neck of the violin. It's going to start in one place and eventually will draw its own wrapping around the neck so that you can come around. Some people, I'm sure you've seen it, or maybe you, you struggle with this, go straight up like this and then their fingers go flat and then they can't reach anymore and they've lost their hand frame, they're out of tune, forget vibrato, you can't do that either. And it's because Thumbo didn't do its job. In this next slide, I'll try to illustrate that a little bit better. So when you're on first position, second position, and third position, Thumbo and first finger are best friends. It's because of how our tendons are made. And anywhere you go between one and three, so you can even go into half position, they're always together. Always, always, always. Now, once you get to fourth position, Thumbo's job changes. Thumbo then begins to do the candy cane stripe so that, uh, there. Now, we're, I'm sure you've seen people have their hand right there and then they can go up. Now, disclaimer, everything depends on how big or small your hands are. Okay, if you have large fingers, long fingers, or a larger hand, you can usually put your thumb right there and go really far up. If you're petite like me, you got to break the rules. So what I do is that once I'm here and I, I have to keep going, I actually start traveling up almost like a cello, the fingerboard so I can maintain my hand frame. There is no way my little hand can go up here and keep my, my uh, hand frame. I have to bring my thumb with me. So backstory, my entire life and in going into even my masters, maybe, maybe a little sooner than that, I was always told, put your thumb here and then go up. Well, I got the flat fingers, vibrato, forget it. Intonation, forget it. I didn't want to be a first violin to save my life. Get me back into the seconds because I didn't want to go up here. And then I realized my fingerings aren't good. And everyone who had taught me were very tall men. Well, that's not going to work. And then I have a, a really good friend. I don't know why my picture just gave a thumbs up, but I guess Zoom liked what I said. Um, so a friend of mine who is smaller than me, I, she was the one that I saw going up her fingerboard. I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, well, I'm small. I got to play. And I was like, well, I don't care. So, oh, and then I did that, changed the fingering. And then my teacher started saying, oh, you must be practicing. And it's like, um, no, <laughs> I didn't tell him out of respect, you know, but I, that's when I'm like, you do you. If you're tiny, get up there. And if you don't need it, then you can leave your thumb back here. But definitely not here. Once you're in third position, you start to do the candy cane stripe and go up. And then all of a sudden I could play up here. I don't mind playing first position, uh, first violin anymore. And I was a happy person. All right. Does anyone have any questions or need any clarification? I might need help with seeing all the people that are in the room. Everybody looks like they're okay. Sweet. Okay, now we're going to work on a couple exercises to just emphasize what I just talked about. First thing is that you're going to take your hand, we're going to do a couple exercises to make sure that you are pronating your hand. Violin and violas, we really pronate. As a matter of fact, if, if I'm doing cello, I've had to retrain my hand because I'm not used to doing this. I'm used to doing this. So I was like trying to play a cello like a violin. It's very interesting. So what you're gonna do is this fleshy part that's underneath your pinky, this one right here. We are gonna turn it towards our face as high as your nose, okay? And we're gonna do what I call umbrella fingers. So they're a little bit curved just to simulate like we're playing. And you're gonna keep your wrist straight. You have a straight line going from your first finger all the way down to your elbow. I'm trying to, I know I'm on Zoom and everything looks weird. So hopefully it's a straight line. And what you're gonna do, keep maintaining that frame, you're gonna bring that fleshy part all the way to your nose. So you're, as you can see, my 
hand is so pronated, you can now see my thumb very clearly. Okay, then I come back out and I'm gonna touch my nose again. So this is kind of like violin yoga. And we're just gonna come back and forth. I call it the doorbell because when I teach little ones, we go ding dong. I know that most of you in here are adults and high schoolers, you don't need ding dong, but in case you have a little one sometime, ding dong works really, really well. But it's just yoga. Great. Okay, now that you know you have a, the pronating hand correctly, we're going to apply it to the violin. And that's where grasshopper comes in. For grasshopper, I take my pinky and I have a good frame. And with my E string, I pluck with the pinky. So let's try that together. Ready? One, two, ready, and pluck. Let's try that again. One, two, ready, and pluck. Great. Now, I'm going to practice going up and doing the candy cane stripe so that my thumb is underneath, right? And then because I'm petite, I'm going to keep going up the fingerboard. And then I'm going to put my pinky as close as I can on the G string of the fingerboard and pluck. Then I'm going to come back down and I got to still follow that candy cane stripe and I'm back to plucking on the E string. Here I go. Thumbo, do your job. Now I can reach, whoops, sorry, G string. I'm going to go back. Thumbo says his job. E string. Go back up. Candy cane stripe. Thumbo on the G string. So this one, you might have to do slowly a couple times to make sure you're doing the thumb correctly, but then you can go pretty fast. Of course you do this up on your shoulder. I'm glad you're all doing that. I couldn't watch. Now, I have a friend that was very, very brave and she told her students to pluck in first position E string, come up, grab the instrument and pick it up. I'm not that brave. But her kids could do it. And I think if the teacher's confident, the kids get confident, I know if I do it, everyone's gonna drop it. So if you are brave, you can do that. Like I said, I, I can't do it. I have to hang on to it. I don't trust me. Yeah. But if it gives you an idea to come over. <laughs> and then this becomes a little easier because if you can pick up your violin, you can do this. Great. Just really make sure that your thumb doesn't get stuck on this end. You really want to bring the thumb under to give yourself a lot of room. Oh, some of you, I just saw you do it. That was amazing. Oh, that was really good. Nice. All right, so that's the grasshopper. So we have our doorbell, and that's the first thing to make sure you're pronating. And then the grasshopper makes sure you're using thumbo in the correct way. Okay, another cool way to make sure you're getting up there and comfy is the harmonics on. Now, you may or may not know, harmonic is split your string straight in the middle. And if you barely touch it with your pinky or your favorite finger, pinky's my favorite, and move your bow quickly, we get that whistle sound. I'm doing it on the A string right now. Okay, so it's just another way to get up there so you're not afraid of it. I do this with uh, almost, uh, let me see. Yeah, except for maybe eight not, but all my beginners do the seven steps because the sooner you introduce shifting, the less scary it seems. Because I remember, I, you know, I did the whole Suzuki thing. I didn't shift until book four. That's a long time not to move up my violin. So this was the scary, cool, but this was so scary. So when I started teaching my middle schoolers and my private students, we would do all these exercises right away. And they thought it was so cool and fun that when I finally told them to play Rosin Eating Zombies and they had to shift up and nobody blinked, everybody just did it. When it was time to do a three octave scale, they all just went, okay, sure. You know, because they're not scared because I was, it took too long. Okay, going back to harmonic song. So, 
so the the words are I like to play my violin. It's just another way to get up there so I'm not scared. Let's try that again. Try it with me. So I like to play my violin. One, two, ready and go. Let's give it one more shot. You know what? You're all muted. So if you're messing up, what happens? Nothing. Cool. Love Zoom. Here we go. One, two, ready and go. Now, if you mess up how many harmonics you did, one, I can't hear you. And it's just, it's just a fun way to do it. You could just go. I just want to get the students up there and not afraid. That's the whole purpose of the harmonic song. And now you learn how to do harmonics. How cool is that? All right, sliding warm up. That one I do have a handout for you. So here I risk showing my messy desktop. Whoops, whoops, no, 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 thank you, I'm not done. Oh. So, you know, when we had 2020, um, the cute thing was I'm not good at technology. So of course this was a nightmare for me. And my wonderful little middle schoolers, instead of saying anything else to me, they just all wrote me like, what are you gonna do? You just went virtual. And I'm like, don't worry, I'm, I'm okay, stay safe, okay? <laughs> they were so sweet. All right, sliding exercises. Now, we're assuming you did all the other things. You're not afraid to move your hand. And what you do is that you play that first measure, E, F, F, E, so it is a low two. And you play it in regular one, low two, low two, one. So I'll, I'll demonstrate. And then, and we'll do it together, I promise. Then you're gonna move, I'm doing bad posture to show, uh, make a point. So here's the one, and then I shift up to the F, and then I shift back down. I'm just using my ears, okay? I'm not worrying about proper anything. I just wanna get there. So I'm gonna play it, and then we're gonna do it together. together. This is just measures one and two. One, two, three, four. Now, if you I'm kind of jumping here a little bit. If you already are comfortable with vibrato, vibrating before you move in a shift forces your hand to relax and release the thumb pressure and it's easier so so much easier to shift if you are not comfortable yet with vibrato that's okay you can still move your hand around no big deal and these exercises are actually going to make vibrato a lot easier all right, let's move on to measures three and four. Now we're playing E, F sharp. So we're gonna play it in first position and then a moving one. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, four. All right, you seem to be doing okay. So we're gonna go on. Now it's E, G. One, two, and three, and four, and. Okay, now we're going to a G sharp. Here we go. Ready and go. Now we have fourth finger A. You don't like your fourth finger? Well, guess what? If you work on that pronating and the grasshopper, fourth finger is not so scary. All right, so let's do that now. Okay, here we go. Ready and play. Cool. So I have these for all the strings. 
Um, and then I, I do teach this to all the uh, string instruments. So I have a whole like class set so that we can all play it together. That's why you see D, A, and G string and not E string. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with Yoast. It's like an entire etude book of shifting. So if you're bored, that's the book to find. And if you can get through Yoast, you can do anything. There's other shifting books as well that are very effective. Uh, the point is just to do it. Just keep playing. I even had a friend who like, <coughs> sure, anything, just get around the violin. <coughs> so those are sirens. Let's try some sirens. Okay, so we're going to be silly. I don't care what finger you use because I can't hear you. Okay, here we go. And sirens. <coughs> And then, oh, I just went into vibrato. Ha. Okay, I'm sure you guys know that one. So you can just, it's just to make your thumb bow relax and move up and down. Hey, Dr. Now, D. D. Yes. Um, somebody asked, uh, well, how do you spell the Yoast book? Oh, like how do you spell that name? Y O S T. Perfect. And then the name of the book, was it just called the Yoast book? Yo's shifting something. It's the only book that Yo's wrote with shifting. You can't, you can't miss it. It's an old book. So if it looks really like, I can't even tell you how old it is, um, but it, it's out there. So if it looks super old, don't think it's wrong. Yeah, Thank a lot you. of great things are very old. <laughs> All right. So uh, how are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing great. Let's do another one. Oops, full disclosure, my child found me. I was hiding. Hi, Cheeky. <laughs> Are you going to bed? I'm teaching a class, okay? Can I have a hug? Can you go to bed? No, but I'm not going to bed. Oh, okay. Can you say hi to the people? That's a lot of people hi. in there. Hi. <laughs> Alrighty, go find Daddy. Thank you. <laughs> He's five. <laughs> and we know our Mississippi stop stops. That's where we're at. Okay, so let's move on to the A stream. Sweetheart, I need you to find daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. Hold on. No. Let me scold daddy, who's supposed to be I'm watching. Scroll you. If any of you are married with children, my husband's doing the where are you? It's like, come get him. <laughs> All right, so let's do the A string now. And it's all moving in ha um, half steps. So we're gonna do all two lines. And if you mess up, what happens? Nothing. All right, here we go. One, two, three, four. G string for you as well. I will, when I stop sharing, I'll try to upload the file. I've only done it once, so we'll try it. If that doesn't work, I'm sure Miss Olivia can tell me what to do. She's pretty good with all this technology fun stuff. Yeah, and all if you right. send it to me, I can send it to everybody who showed up tonight. Oh, sweet, we'll do that. All right, so next thing. Now, the way I teach my students and the way I practice too, I try to find a gazillion ways to do the same thing over and over again, but in different settings so you don't get bored, right? You want your students to feel like they've learned something new today. So I have all these little tricks and I'm always trying to add more tricks into my bag so we can just keep repeating until we're comfortable, but we're doing something new. Nobody's bored. So this is the countdown song. 
Again, I'm not great with technology, so forgive the two uh, empty measures there. And this is written out for my string orchestra. And first you play for uh, first position. And you, for the violins, we're going to be the top line. And then we jump down to where he says VLN and you play that spot. So the tune, I'll play you the tune so you can hear it and then we'll play it together. And it's... Super simple. Just remember low twos. Okay, let's try it. One and two and three and four. to your students you could teach it to them by rote i've done both uh and i'm still trying to come up with clever lyrics that go with it but i haven't been successful yet but it's a catchy tune teachers beware once they know this they will play it a lot so be ready okay let's try it one and, more oh, time Dr. Sorry? DC, sorry someone had a question uh does the fingerboard need to be slippery on the side to move your left thumb up easily to higher positions that makes me wonder when was the last time you wiped down your instrument? Because you may have noticed like sometimes it gets gunky or if you have the finger tapes, it gets gunky. Um, if you have a private teacher or you have a, or a school orchestra teacher, there is a special cleaner for your instruments. You cannot go and get Pledge or Fabuloso or don't, don't do that because it eats the varnish of your instrument and the varnish is part of why your instrument sounds so wonderful so you really want to make sure you don't do that there is a special cleaner that i know your teachers can give you and it's just, it's specific for wooden instruments and you can clean that off um what i told my middle schoolers because they were on tapes and it was really the tapes that would make it kind of gunky and sticky to wipe down the neck as well as their strings and underneath and the stick of their bow and that will solve a lot of things eventually you still have to clean it because it is glue under those tapes but definitely you want to clean that off i clean my instrument um at least every six months if not more it depends how much i practiced and a follow-up question somebody had was when do you start uh taking the tapes off Haha. -ha. Okay. <laughs> I laugh because my, my, my college students asked me the same question. There are, is research showing that it is better to start with tapes rather than not having tapes. Uh, it's for several reasons. One, if you have a student with uh, sensory issues or anything like that, or uh, a disability of any kind, the tape really shows an anchor, provides an anchor for them. If you are a teacher, it's easier to see if the fingers off the tape when you have a sea of 40, 50 kids, <laughs> rather than like going down the row. Of course, we go down the row once in a while. Um, but you know, just for time's sake, I can see if they're doing the right thing. So I had colored tapes for each different note. So everybody had red tape for their first finger. Everybody's B on the A string was a red tape. Everybody's C sharp was white. Everybody's D was uh, gold. So I could, when I'm first starting them, I go, put your finger on the gold tape. And they knew, right? Depending on the instrument, they knew what to do. Then after their first year, they usually moved up an instrument, right? Because they got bigger. And, or if they didn't, they, I would give them the more valuable instrument because now they're a little older and I trust them. And those tapes became black so that they could get used to it. And then it depended. If I saw they were relying on it too much, for fun, I would take off everybody's tapes and figure it out. But this is with a, a class that feels secure, okay, in their playing, and they can hear it. If they play in tune, the tapes can come off. Now, if you have a student that needs tapes, give them the tapes. Put it on black. Who cares? I remember when I played the Bartok Concerto, I honestly went and made myself a little tape because, you know, that one note you got to find in the middle of nowhere? It's like... <laughs> I've never been able to find that thing when you're scared and it's hard and ooh, it's Bartok concerto. So I just marked my own little finger tape and I nailed it every time. 
Okay, so you do you, you do what you need to do. If there's that crazy note and you still can't play it in tune, put a tape. It's not hurting anybody. You can even put a little bit of a pencil mark if that helps, if you really don't wanna have a twinkle tape on there. But if it's black, who's saying it? So I always say you do you, whatever works. And perfect segue, somebody asked, can you explain the shifting in the countdown song again, please? Yes, I haven't even done it. I got interrupted. Oh, I haven't perfect. even done it. Okay, there we go. <laughs> You're so sweet. Yeah, we haven't done it. I just want you to do the tune first. So let's get back into this. Let's do the tune one more time so you have it in your ear. And then I'm going to show you the fingering, which is the shifting. All right, so one more time. One and two and three and four. And this can be an intonation exercise too, right? Can you land that note in tune? You know, even on my, I have off days too, and I'll be like, ooh, I should practice my calm down song. All right, let's put in some fingerings in here. Here. All right. Oh, I'm like having a good technology day. This is huge, people. This is huge. You have no idea. Okay. So now I have my fingerings. So don't don't worry about the viola, cello, bass, unless you're a teacher, then you're probably really curious. So if you look at, let's see if I, ooh, I'm really having a good day, people. All right. So the violin part, D3, like normal. Then I say D2, you just went into second position. D1, you just went into third position. I honestly don't even talk about the positions because I want them to learn the instrument organically and not think about those things. Once they can do it, then I go, hey, you are doing something called going into different positions. And they're like, oh, okay. And they're not scared. So to demonstrate, the first one's D3. <laughs> Remember, thumb bow always has to go with first finger. So you move up and put your two there. I'm doing bad posture so you can see my fingers. Now first finger. Go back to second finger. Then third finger. I hope I'm showing that right. So you, you went from first to second to third to second to third. So you're jumping all over the place in a cute little tune. So let's try that. We'll do it slowly. And if you mess up, what happens? Nothing. Ah, I'm seeing nothing. Good job. Good job. We have too much stress in our lives nowadays. Say nothing more often. Okay. All right, here we go. We'll go slow. Three and four. Now we're going to do the A string, same pattern. Let me make this smaller so you can see it. All right, here we go. Ready and go. Woo! I like looked over at my own like image on Zoom and I went, what? And then I played out of tune. Sorry about that. All right, <laughs> let's do the whole tune now with the shifting. And if we mess up, what happens? Nothing. Good job. All right, here we go. Three and four. can do and get them moving around and then is this it where are you did I lose you what I do with it oh all my luck went away seriously one second one moment please is it in here 
Nope, that's just what I brought up. This one? Yes! All right. Anybody heard of Twinkle? Okay. Hopefully you've seen it before. Let me blow it up. All right. This is out of a book called Learning Together. My mentor, uh, mentors uh, wrote this book. It's written for string orchestra. There's one book for each uh, instrument and it's made to be played unison wise, kind of like the Suzuki style, but it also has, you can see down there, a bass line and a harmony. So you can make these into breakout pieces and they, uh, they're they really cute. So whenever my principal uh, would say, hey, we have a luncheon tomorrow, can your kids play? <laughs> I always said, yeah, because we've been working on these things and there's your instant little concert and it's like chamber music and it's easy and it sounds great. And then they're like, oh, we'll invite you again. And that's what you want, right? Not that we love doing that kind of thing, but hey, you, you need to let them know you're there. Some of these things can, uh, like the later paces, you can even take them on a gig, real easy. And there's also a volume two, and so you have your whole little gig book there or breakout concert. All right. I am sure you guys have done Twinkle before, so we're going to play through Twinkle, just in case we have someone who's never heard of Twinkle. And we're just going to do it in first position. In our tempo, I'll give you an introduction and we're coming in, okay? So... <laughs> my students learn with a bow okay it's a tune that most people have heard so that's why we do it and then what I do is like okay, well, okay here's your challenge because they always go ah oh, twinkle again yeah but here's your challenge you can only use your first finger and only the D string you have to play the piece with only your first finger and only on the D string so I, I show them like and they'll look for it. And that's okay, because they're trying to find it. And I'll give you a second to do that in just a moment. And then they, then they don't stop, right? Then you hear for we. And the next thing you know, they're all over the violin and they think it's a game and they're not scared. Okay, so I'm going to give you a, a second. Let's just mess around with line one. I see some of you messing around. Great. Do it. Find it. No, do it. Do it. Do it. All right, I'm seeing a lot of brave people and I see some people figuring out like, oh, I have to move my thumb. Oh yeah, past third position. Start doing the candy cane stripe. Aha, uh -huh, this, this piece will bust you really quick if you're not doing it. Yeah, some of you are smiling. You're like, oh, that's why I can't get up there. Yep. And to make your life harder, you should be able to vibrate it all. What? Because <laughs> if you do all the right position, See my, ugh, so if you can see my thumb. My thumb is right under there so that I can get up there. You can do this with any piece, okay? 
when I am working with, again, I do this with all my beginners. We get this far. Let me stop sharing. No one wants to see my messy desk. Okay. Uh, so I have my beginners. They all do this. And then we come back their second or third year. And then we just like, we're adding vibrato. We're adding speed. We can play it faster. And then if any of you, have any of you done uni tunes? Anybody familiar with uni tunes? It's a, a great reading book. It's very, very basic. It repeats notes over and over again. So it's really good when you're learning how to read. And then there's a volume two and it goes into like, uh, like harder keys and that, and then it's easier to sight read. So my kids were really good at sight reading because I would use uni tunes. And I'll tell you right now, whoever marketed that book did a mistake. They put cartoons in the front. When I showed my middle schoolers, I thought they were going to eat me alive. So I told them, I'm sorry for the cheesy cartoons, but I swear this is a great sight reading book. And once they got over the cartoons and then we made fun of the cartoons because they wouldn't hold the violin right and that sort of thing. Uh, they, their sight reading was amazing. It was really, really good. And it's like pages and pages of a key. It's a different key all the time. Okay, anyway, uh, that anything like that, any of your old songs, something really easy, play it in, a, in another position, right? So instead of... And you know how like sometimes you're bored in orchestra because they're doing something that's remedial and you're like, I don't need this help. I don't want to play this scale. Well, play it in another position. In the college, we mix up our primary students with secondaries. So that means a trumpet player might be playing violin for the first time and they're sitting next to someone who's been playing violin their whole life. Well, I, t I turn to the violinist who's been doing it their whole life and I go, eighth position, go. And they're, oh, okay, okay. And then they're up there, you know, and then they're learning and they're, they're not bored. So I would strongly recommend that. I'm not saying I was ever bored, but that's how I learned vibrato. I would just start messing around while everybody's doing other stuff. So I, I really perfected my vibrato that way. Anyway, uh, so like if you're doing a scale, well, shift. Or go somewhere else. Now I'm in fourth. Just move around while everybody else is trying to figure out. Because some people need a little more time and that's okay. I love it. People are trying it already. Perfect. And do different fingers. Find out where it is on your instrument. Because the best advice I ever received when I was uh, getting my undergrad, I think. Yeah, it was my undergrad. You need to know your violin fingerboard like a piano. A piano, they say C, I can go right up to it, slam. But this thing, if you take off the tapes, where the heck is it? So you need to learn where all your notes are. And oh, vi violin's easy. Figuring it out is hard. That's the hard part. But once you got it, you got it. Oh, I love it. Everyone's practicing. That's a teacher's, makes a teacher's heart sing. All right. So that brings us to the conclusion of my discussion on shifting. Like I said, there's lots of books out there. You can make up your own stuff. If you don't have the means, you can do it on a scale. You can do it on anything at all. Um, even essential elements, pull them out. Everybody play that in sixth position. You know, you can do that. You probably have those books. So I believe uh, we have enough time if anybody has any questions, concerns. And uh, before I forget, or if you take off, thanks for letting me talk about shifting. I just love the violin. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Cortez. Really oh, appreciate you're it. You're welcome. I have a high school orchestra and middle school orchestra. So I have several things going on at once. Um, I'm sure you understand. Oh, yeah. um, those needs and everything. Um, I was wondering after fourth position, do you mark your um, fingerboards for high school with pencil or do you still just do the tapes for black? I usually do the tapes if they need it. Some of them by then they're ready and they just take off. And some of them, they kind of like training wheels. 
and you got to read your kid, right? If it's going to cause them anxiety, what am I doing? That's not what my purpose is, right? I want them to feel secure. And once they're really confident, they're the ones ripping them off. You know, it's like, uh, they'll even show up with them gone. And I'll be like, where's your tape? <laughs> and they're like, I don't need it. <laughs> Great. That's what you want, right? So yeah, whatever your student needs. I'm sure you're a wonderful teacher and you know that already. So I support that. Yeah, well, thank you guys so much for joining and participating. I love seeing all the violins out and everybody just playing along. It was awesome. So thank you guys. And I hope you enjoy um, the rest of your evening. If you have questions about Vandercook, feel free to uh, message admissions at vandercook.edu.